Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald and alongside me is my very, very dear colleague and friend, Eric Galina. Eric, hello. Hello, Martin. Hello. How's it going? Uh, all is well. Uh, unfortunately, I was not in Tokyo, uh, so <laughs> you know things could be a little bit better. But uh, you've you've just come back from your holiday, so you know you, you're you're kind of completely refreshed, you know, full of energy now. So we thought we we're actually going to do a new podcast uh, this time about the Tokyo Motor Show. Yeah, you you excited? You're ready for this? Sounds good. Excited as I'll ever be. Cool. All right, then uh, let's actually get cracking on this one, uh, and let's give the the listeners a little bit of an overview on the Tokyo Motor Show. So, the Tokyo Motor Show is one of these shows that are happening biannually. So that means it's every couple every couple of years, uh, usually in the odd years. So, 2019, 2017, 15. The next one, hopefully, will be in 2021. And the TMS has always been the biggest show for the Japanese manufacturers, of course. In the past, uh, when the show was a little bit bigger, uh, we had revealings or unveilings of cars such as the first Bugatti Shiro was uh, shown over there. But in the last few years, this has really become the go-to show for most of the Japanese car manufacturers to show, you know, their quirkiness, their weirdness, their ideas, their innovation, and everything that the common Westerner would probably say is a little bit strange. Uh, is that is that a good sum up from, from from what we can gather from the past few years of Tokyo? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, definitely Tokyo is um, well. The Japanese shows are generally very uh, quirky, um, to use uh, your word. Uh, it's it's certainly, yeah. I mean, for the other motor shows that we see in the U.S. and the, and in Europe, it's very unique. Even to China, it's very unique. Correct, and uh, we have to explain this maybe a little bit. So, if you've never been to Tokyo, if you've never been to Japan, you will not understand where this quirkiness is coming from. So, the Japanese they see design, they see you know their products a little bit differently. They have different kind of restrictions to them as well which is, you know, for example, the K cars. So, you know, tiny cars with a very limited amount of um, um, of engine capacity. So they're not allowed to, you know, go over a certain kind of engine uh, power. That's, that's something that they're using a lot in Japan, if you've ever been there. And obviously the Tokyo Motor Show still shows a lot for that. So it's still a very, you know, local show. But it is, in my opinion, the most fun show in the world because there are still people out there that are, you know, trying to do something different. They're trying to show you some weirder cars that you would probably not see in a Western world or in a, in a Chinese show because they, they all seem a little bit outside the box thinking or like, you know, very much different to your day to day activity. But this is what you know, makes the show absolutely fantastic. Um, it's, you know, not necessarily right in the middle of Tokyo, but it's super easy accessible to actually get to the show. It's, it used to be very big. It's now a little bit smaller, a little bit more narrow. But if you go in there, you can see, you know, I, I remember I was there in 2017. And I think Toyota had a total of like four or five show cars there. So they definitely still take this whole thing extremely seriously. And, what we can say, I think we're going to talk mostly about cars that are from Japanese manufacturers, simply because there's not that many non-Japanese manufacturers that have shown uh, something something completely new, um, which is quite a bit unfortunate, but it was to be expected, I think. Yeah, I mean, in the past few years, we've seen Tokyo go from a must-attend event to now uh, very much a, a purely nationalistic show. So, um, you know, it's a domestic show where domestic manufacturers shine. So, obviously, um, Nissan, Toyota brands are going to be getting the limelight and uh, Mazda as well. But you, very much a Japanese show. Very much so. And uh, let's actually let's get cracking with the Japanese manufacturers. And I would actually like to start with uh, Suzuki because I think Suzuki was one of these brands we never really spoke about on the pod. And we don't know for what reason that is because they're not really well represented on the European shows. They don't really show these new things. But I would like to start 
with them because they had a couple of cool concepts. And these concepts were clearly inspired by the idea of product design of potentially what is now the Honda E, you know, so the, the electric car. And I would like to start with the Suzuki uh, Wacu Spo, which is, it almost looks like a direct competitor to what the Honda E is nowadays. Wouldn't you say, Eric? Uh, I, I suppose, I suppose so. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a notch back design that does some actually re- really weird things over at the rear. It transforms actually into a little, um, into a little shooting break, but, uh, yeah, it's very much a, a K car and Suzuki's really been known to, to showcase, uh, quite well at the, uh, at the Tokyo Motor Show. And, you know, yeah, for some reason, I mean, you know, perhaps because they don't sell all that well outside of the Japanese market, but the Japanese market is clearly their home market. And um, they always m- have much fanfare with vehicles that are unveiled there. I 100% agree. And uh, if you look into the Wacu uh, Spo, you can clearly see that Honda is a little bit ahead, I think, in terms of the design language, in terms of the design execution as well. Uh, it, it doesn't look as well refined. The surfacing doesn't look as good. I, I am not a big fan of the, the two-color the two color tone that they have put on it. Um, the lights look a little bit weird. You know, there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, is it a grill or something like that on the, on the lower end where I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So you have a little bit of a feeling that this is something like, oh, you know, like, like people like the Honda, let's do something towards that kind of direction. Um, it, it, it looks a little bit unfinished uh, from, from, from my perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, like you said, uh, we, we didn't attend. I, I wasn't there, so I don't know what these cars look like in the in the metal. Uh, I think it's really important. Like a lot of design decisions are made by looking at photographs and um, things like that. But it's really, really difficult to design to judge a design unless you kind of walk around it. I mean, there's there's some interesting details um, on this car. To me, it's you know when you look at it from a silhouette perspective. Um, even in the three quarter view, it's it's very much has a retro look to it. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, Japanese kind of really enjoy this, um, and you know, this nineteen sixties seventies kind of era when you know they were really quite strong, um, putting out cars in all markets and very very strong in terms of uh, of sales. Um, now Suzuki has been for a long time now, kind of clinging to that. Um, they're not showing particularly well advanced things, and this Waku Spo is definitely um, case in point for that. Um, you know, they it, it looks like a, a, maybe a Datsun Five Ten. I mean, there's some very interesting elements. Like again, I'm just judging from mm. photos, but it has this um, this chrome applique that kind of just uh, underscores the belt line and brings it over into the hood. I'm not mad at the two-tone color scheme. That's fine. Um, you know, it's, it is a very small car, so they needed to get some sort of visual drama. And I think the two-tone works well, the way it comes all the way down the fender into the front. Um, it, it is, is nice. It's a, it's an interesting treatment that we haven't really seen before. Um, and you know, they've done two-tone on, on a lot of the, the concepts that they've shown, um, in the past as well. Uh, so this year was no exception. Yeah, and they've continued to tone with the second concept that they've shown, which is called the Hanare uh, concept, which is again a toaster. I know you know we've we've had this conversation beforehand, and you know some people don't like me using the term toaster. Uh, it is a box, but apart from the wheels, I actually like this thing. It is ultra Japanese. It looks like you know it's covered in wood. With um, you know, with, with nice little accents in white on this as well. But if you actually open it, which has a, a massive gold wing door with it as well, there's an absolutely massive screen in there. Of course, we're in Japan, so technology and you know screens need to be in in an appropriate size. And uh, it is it is an autonomous you know an autonomous object uh, pretty much. But this seems this, this seems actually you know quite Japanese. It seems quite cool. Um, it seems quite clean. What Japanese you know uh, design culture is, anyways. Uh, it seems very exact. You know, it seems that it's just it, it just works very well. Is it something special? Is it something that we have not seen before? Definitely not. But it's still something where I'm saying like, whoa, this is uh, you know. This seems like it, it could come to life once the autonomous world 
um, is actually is actually coming to the next step because it's it, it does have this big screen. It doesn't have you know fancy technology that we will probably not see in a very short amount of time. So this seems a bit more like a realistic concept moving into the uh, the, the generation of autonomous driving. Yeah, I mean you know like you said it's. It's a mono volume. It's a it's a van basically, but clearly there's no driver's seat. It's just two lounge chairs on either side with a massive screen inside. Um, yeah, I mean, how close to production this would potentially be is, um, you know, I, I don't think is it's it's anywhere near. Um, people, you know, I, I I tend to have a pessimistic attitude towards uh, autonomy anyway. I don't think that we'll we're going to see this anytime soon. Um, but you know, nonetheless, it, it doesn't prevent manufacturers from showcasing it in various different forms. Mm. So, I mean, from an exterior perspective, yeah, there's there's some like fender flares over the wheels. It's um, you know they have these slats that uh, it's not actually made of wood. It's just it, it, it needed to do you know to add some sort of visual drama to it. So um, you know those those lines kind of, you know, tend to make it sit further down and, and less like, you know, more horizontal. Mm. Um, but you know, it's, it's just a a two tone vehicle with, you know, a couple of lines in there to make it look like it's, it's perhaps wood covered, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a little, it's a little box. It's interesting. Um, you know, the front is obviously very, uh, technology laden with the, uh, the whole DRG being a, a screen again, um, showcasing the lights and probably various different, uh, um, you know, modes or commands or whatever, like messages perhaps to, uh, to other, um, road users. Um, yeah, I mean, it's again, like the, the, I think the wheel covers, uh, the spats, if you will, over the wheels, um, is very much a retro homage, um, feel to it. And, uh, yeah. Hmm. That it's, uh, it's an interesting little little vehicle. I mean, certainly with the way the DLO is, um, you know, it doesn't have much in terms of windows. Um, it's got a very thin mm. kind of, you know, um, windscreen and a, a very thin backlight as well. And then even on the sides, it's like there are no real windows, um, just a very thin um, DLO above the entire kind of uh, volume of this vehicle. So yeah, that is, uh, that is interesting. Um, it could be potentially claustrophobic inside there, but uh, <laughs> speaking about motion sickness there, yeah, <laughs> you're getting sick because you can't look outside. <laughs> if you're happy just to look at a screen and, you know, be transported to places. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, the thing is, you know, I don't know how big this is in terms of size wise, it's probably four mm-hmm. meters and change, I would assume. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't have that much in terms of seating capacity. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm just seeing it in one guys with a big screen over one side of the door. So if all you've got is two or three seats and something, it's not really very efficient either. So I don't know. Um, yeah, um, it, it leaves me lukewarm. It's not particularly adventurous. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's about all I can say. On <laughs> I can tell you what does not leave me uh, lukewarm, but extremely hot in that sense. It is one of my favorite cars and they've shown a couple of concepts. They're not very special, but I just want to mention them here. This is the Suzuki Hustler. Now this, you know, it, this is by far the coolest name for any car that you can think of. It's a little key. K car that you know has a lot of space in it and they've just kind of developed a little bit further so it's nothing really special if you've ever seen a hustler before you know you've you, you, you've seen them um and you know i know a lot of people that love them i personally you know it's one of my absolute favorite cars but i am always happy to see suzuki to kind of develop the hustler forward to not drop it you know it's it's such a cool little concept uh, you can do so many cool things around it as well. I've seen, you know, Hustlers, uh, Custom 8 is almost like a Hummer H2, obviously in much smaller, you know, G-classes, those kind of things. Uh, I was just very happy to see a couple of pictures. So special mention to the Suzuki Hustler because it's one of my favorites um, on the Suzuki stand. And uh, Eric, what, what would you prefer? We go to Mazda or do you want to go to Nissan? What, what's your what's your wish? Um, I... I- I just, I just want to make one quick comment. Like, oh, yeah. I haven't been to Tokyo in a, in a number of years, but um, I remember seeing this Hustler concept the last time I went, and that probably would have been about six years or seven years ago. <laughs> um, I remember seeing this thing already then, and it's like, why is it still a concept? I mean, surely it's production by now, and I don't really – yeah, 
I don't know. I think the Jimny hits it out of the park. This thing, no, proportionally, it's not right. Um, there's a lot of things that leak, leave me uh, kind of questioning why they've done it in certain ways. From a utilitarian perspective, sure, um, but you know, it's it's not going to have um, the the same appeal as as some other uh, ve- vehicles of yeah. this size. Again, like the the Jimny, in my opinion, is way better than this. Um, this, you know. It's it, proportionally just, uh, I'm not, I'm not entirely sold on it. Um, and I remember seeing, again, as a concept many, many years ago. So I don't understand why it's still build a concept. Okay. Anyway. So just, just to explain this, so the, the Suzuki Hustler itself is uh, a production car. So you can buy this, uh, you know, it's being exported also to Russia, uh, you know, to, to places outside of Japan. Um, these concepts that they're doing is pretty much just like, you know, they show, what could we do with this? So this red one is a little bit more like, you know, defender type, uh, a little bit more adventurous. The pink one that they have shown there, I have no idea what this is supposed to be like. I think it's just the uh, facelift of the Hustler that they're, that they're kind of previewing here. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love these things. I've seen them on the road in Tokyo, in Japan. And, uh, you know, I, I, I literally, you know, I got on the plane. Uh, I had my little Tommy car toy Hustler with me and I absolutely love it. And I wanted to buy one in Japan, but unfortunately, they're not road legal in, in Germany. It's really difficult to get licenses for uh, K-cars. But uh, yeah, the current generation Hustler, I'm a big fan. But I, I do see where you're coming from because it's sometimes strange. It's just a color and trim job, and then they call it uh, with a couple of accessories, and then they call it a concept. Exactly. Um, it's called marketing. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Nissan or Mazda, what do you prefer, Eric? Um, I, uh, I, I mean, a lot of people have been raving about this, uh, this new Mazda and, and from, a from, from a powertrain perspective, I guess, you know, it's, uh, it makes sense. Um, it's the first electric e- car from, uh, from Mazda. Um, yeah, it's all right, uh, from a design perspective, but I'm not, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like where they've gone with this whole, um, you know, um, coupe like roof line i suppose uh again it's very difficult to judge because all of these pictures that we're viewing right now were, were taken on the stand and mm. uh, it's either press press or very dark stands and um yeah i don't know i guess the the mazda uh, let's talk about that for a little bit i mean it's it kind of follows on from the design direction that they've gone with the cars it's far more of a, an suv um you know crossover proposal again with a fastback roof which is kind of weird um but i like the fact that they are using the doors from the rx8 and Mm -hmm. um you know so that's very mazda like um but all of these little suvs they have uh around the real arches these uh this like big uh rubber addendum that kind of you know it's not even rubber it's just plastic um to make it look more rugged than it is Mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know i mean you know again another two-tone vehicle um, I like the lamps, I suppose, you know, that's again, following Mazda's, you know, what they've done. This is very near production ready if it's not production already. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting take on the first electric car from, from Mazda, but it makes sense that they would build a little SUV because they've got to store all the batteries underneath. So it's got to high, be a high riding vehicle anyway, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you know, for me, and uh, and again, we we have to mention as we obviously unfortunately have not been to Tokyo this year. Um, I'm not so sure about this. I mean, if I see the the way that Mazda has been, you know, progressing over the past, let's say, few years with the Kodo design language and and everything that goes along with it, um, this almost seems like a step. You know, a step of stalling or, you know, a step of not moving forward, uh, unfortunately. I think uh, the rear in particular is not well resolved. It looks like it comes from a kind of an Opal slash, uh, you know, Vauxhall, uh, you know, where I'm saying like, you know, they, they could have worked a little bit better with this. Um, it's not as fluid, you know, from, from, from the surfacing and from, from the overall picture. Uh, it looks a little bit more edgy. Uh, and I'm not quite sure if they had to do that based on saving money because obviously electric vehicles are so expensive in terms of the, the, the platform and in terms of the, the components at the moment or where, where the reason comes from. So it's, 
what do you like to say? Like, you know, you're not mad at it. Like, I'm, I'm not mad at it. I'm just kind of disappointed that they, that they haven't moved on from, or like, you know, they haven't used the design language to such a degree on what, uh, you know, what the past they have shown. And this is a little bit of a letdown, I have to say. It's unfortunately something where I'm saying like they, that, that could have, that could have been much better. And it seems that they might have had too much budget restraints uh, due to the electric platform to make this actually become a, a you know really nice monster. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's interesting that you say the rear is your less. I mean, besides the fastback kind of roof line, um, I like the afterburner tail lamps. You know, that's that's one element that Mazda has been mm-hmm. doing well. Um, the lighting design on these cars is quite good. For yes. cheap cars, yeah. I mean, they do really pull out all the stops when it comes to lighting as well. They should because that is a really um, important element visually for uh, for any vehicle. So, you know, whilst I'm not uh, a big fan of the typology or indeed the, the profile with the, the sloping roof line, it, it kind of, you know, um, decreases a lot of the practicality of that vehicle. Um, it's still, I guess, uh, an interesting proposition from Mazda for its first electric car. I do, I do agree on that one, and I, I think what I, what I want to express with this is, um, I've read a lot of Twitter do, doing the motor show, and I've seen a lot of comments on this one, and I think the general kind of disappointment with this car, uh, the MX30, uh, came because the stuff that Massa brought out over the past few years was so good that this seems like oh. This is not as good as the other stuff that we have seen, you know. So I think compared to other companies, this is still obviously quite good. But in regards to what we have seen from Mazda, um, you would kind of, you know, you had a little bit of the feeling like, eh, you know, this could be better. Um, so that's a little bit of the feeling that I had uh, from looking into the car. But generally speaking, um, it's, uh, you know, it's it, it's all right. And if it comes like that, um, it, it does look good enough. Uh, to, to obviously have a good place into the market. I mean, they, the, the quality of the Mazda has always been uh, quite good for the price that they had. So um, let's let's see if this car comes exactly like this, or if it's just you know very close to production, but not one hundred percent one hundred percent done yet. All right. Um, so moving on, Nissan. <laughs> you want to do Nissan? Uh, yeah, yeah. The Nissan, the Nissan Aria is is um, the crossover concept that was shown. Um, there's no like production indication on this, but again, it's uh, it it tends to follow what other manufacturers have done with the uh, the glossy, um, you know, black piano black appliques around the wheels. We've seen that on numerous concept cars in the past. Um, for uh, you know, a, a, an off roader. Um, you know, I don't really think it makes much sense. But again, I don't think these are off-road vehicles uh, per se. It's just a crossover, so it has more space um, than a conventional car. And again, for packaging, it makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I don't know if there's any production intent for this. Uh, there's interesting design elements. Um, you know, the use of copper is pervasive throughout many of these concepts, which is obviously signaling uh, electric propulsion. Um, so that's definitely one of the, the huge trends that's going on right now is the use of copper. Um, yeah. And the, the grill is, is still there, but you know, obviously not as functional as it would be in an ice car. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not a bad, bad looking car. Um, it was developed entirely in Japan. Um, yeah, the little, again, it's got a, a, a fastback kind of sloping, uh, roof line, um, to the rear. And uh, bespoke mm. tires as well, like many of these concepts do. So it's it's really just a, a good way to, you know, I guess stir up some interest in this EV revolution where they could potentially go what automatic manufacturers are thinking about in terms of what to provide um, the clients that are going to be making this uh, transition into electric. Mm. Uh, I Again, from the pictures, um, you can clearly see that there is – and we've, we've spoken about this a lot, I think, uh, in, in the past, you know, motor show reviews. There's a lot of talent in Nissan. I think this this is what, what what becomes almost evident when you see, it, in particular, the Aria show car. It's it's just well made, you know. It for me, the surfacing, the proportions fit. Um, I'm just not 100 percent sure. I don't like these crossovers, you know. I don't I don't like them from any. A manufacturer, no matter if they're concepts or if they're you know, already on the streets with BMW X6 uh, 
you know, uh, the Mercedes GLE, I think, or whatever it is. Like, you know, I just don't see the point of these cars because they're big, but you don't have any space in them. Um, but what I do like is that, you know, Nissan seems to find a language that comes with the front. It, you know, from if we if we look back into the other show cars that they that they have presented, it seems that they're finding their rhythm, that they're finding their way of what they want the Nissan front to be in the future. Um, they will be playing a lot with lighting, of course, on that one. And and I think this car is quite confident. You, know, you see that it seems like they, they know what they want to do. I know, you know, uh, compared to the other concept, this seems much more towards the production direction uh, with the proportions and all these things. So it's, uh, it's once again, it doesn't blow me away, but you do understand, you, you do see that Nissan know what they're doing. And you can see that this is clearly a step forward towards their design direction uh, now. And you can clearly see where Alfonso is coming in now, uh, slowly after taking over from, uh, from Shiro Nakamura. Where you know you see these changes, this car looks much more, I would say, European. You know, this this could this could also be coming from an American or a Western manufacturer. This doesn't necessarily need to come from a Japanese one. And this is where you see the maturity and you know where Nissan wants to be in terms of also its market. I think so. Uh, it's a, it's a very interesting one, and and, and I'm going to be interested to see where we see the keys or the cues uh, in the new and production models. Well, like the first cues in the new production models uh, from cars like this. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think you know the exterior is is one thing, but the interior I think is quite nice. I mean, it's it definitely has a premium feel. It's really using technology to um, its benefit for sure. Like with all of the embedded. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of concepts are doing this now in terms of embedding the controls into the um, the uh, surfaces um, w- where you don't actually have dials or anything. It's all kind of touch and embedded within the uh, the uh, the IP, for example. Um, the screens, of course, are, are paramount, but it has some really cool, uh, interesting lighting elements as well um, within the doors and and around um, on the. Uh, on the on the IP as well as uh, in the uh, in the center control console on mm. the armrest. So um, you know technology is definitely um, taking a, a a front seat quite literally in terms of uh, augmenting the premium kind of value mm. perceived quality of this uh, of this vehicle because it's it's quite sedate um, but it's also very modern and appealing and minimalistic and um, you know very pleasing and. Uh, definitely sophisticated. So um, I think the interior of this car is quite nice. Uh, yeah, and I think you know from 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 the interior perspective, this actually seems that it could become a production interior. It doesn't look too fancy, you know. From from what we can see from the pictures, that it, this is very far away from a production interior. Uh, also, with the steering wheel, looks you know looks looks very much ready to go, and so that's going to be very interesting to see. Um, what uh, you know? At what point this comes in uh, into the production, the production cars? Uh, something that probably we won't see right away from Nissan is the IMK concept, and they have had the you know the the IM series of concepts for quite some time now, and uh, so it's it's going to be interesting to see what we or, or, or let me ask this way: what, what do you think of this IM concept uh, from Nissan? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, this is, this isn't for me. This is, you know, uh, this is a little city urban, you know, runabout. Um, I, I guess the, the wheels are just so tiny, um, compared to the, the body to glass ratio, the body to wheel ratio. It's, you know, it's, um, yeah, I, I just, it, it looks like a little toy thing. Um, and you know, for, for the urban environment, I'm sure it works just fine. Um, but, um, you know, from an aesthetic perspective, it's, it's really small, um, it's really, uh, narrow, uh, and it's really tall. So it's, you know, none of those (laughs) elements make for a particularly pleasing, um, exterior aesthetic. Again, you know, Nissan is doing well in terms of lighting, um, on the exterior of these cars. I think, um, you know, from the front end as well, it's got a very clearly, uh, you know, demarcated, uh, DRG, like it's very unique and, and individual with these like lighted grills and, you know, really slender lamps. Uh, 
you know, just kind of the full width of the, uh, of the hood as well. Um, it's from that perspective, I guess it's, it's, they, they tried to make it more, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, aggressive looking, perhaps more, um, uh, appealing. It's not really all that cute. Um, but you know, I guess the, the issue that I have is the, the side profile, but again, it's going to be a, a very practical car probably. Um, and you know, the tires are just so tiny and I've never been a big fan of four spoke wheels. I think you need five spokes to mm-hmm. kind of give it some movement, but, uh, you know, it, you know, it's, I don't know much about this thing. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, to me, it looks like a little, a modern version of a little K car, but, uh, you know, with a couple of Nissan design elements, particularly in the light, lower light catcher on the body side, but, um, you know, and then the rising shoulder and all the rest, but it's not, um, <laughs> it's not to my taste and, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that I would want to, uh, to, to be seen in or to have in my garage. But, um, <laughs> I, I find, I find some of the details a little bit strange. There's like, there's a kind of, in, you know, rotten grass carpet in there. That, that it, it's a weird brown uh, that just looks a little bit strange. Um, the interior is nice. I mean, with the colorways and the wood and, you know, it's got the warmth and the lights and, you know, again, a very strong copper theme. So on the pedals, on the IP, on the, you know, stocks on the steering wheel, everything is kind of um, alluding to this uh, electric future again. But, um, you know, I, I don't know, white again on an interior, I don't know. Um, but it, it is a, a concept. So, you know, whatever. Yeah. Okay. But can we, can we just say, can we just say one thing? Interiors should never be white. I think we both agree on that one. And I have to say, I absolutely hate brown exterior paints. You know, like, I, I just don't understand why anybody would do that. I do understand it. Even if it's bronze, bronze, brown, any kind of these kind of colors, I, you know, for details, yes, no problem whatsoever. But as main colors, I find this extremely difficult. Not, not, not up my alley whatsoever. And then combine it with white, it's just like, hmm. Like what are we like we're back in seventies or whatever? Yeah, well, it's I you know like they say, fashion it kind of comes in cycles, and it's very much on trend now. The uh, the brown or the bronze colors um, on especially on uh, on Japanese vehicles. I mean, you know, as I remember a kid, uh, you know, a friend of mine when we were in uh, in university had a. Uh, a Toyota that was champagne and champagne is basically just a light brown. And, uh, you know, it, that color always kind of threw me off, but it is, it is very much a Japanese thing, very much like purple, for example, which, um, Mercedes kind of, uh, uh, honed in on as well in terms of the feeling of luxury. I mean, the, the, the purple color, for example, is, is, uh, an infinity trademark color, but the, uh, these browns and these bronze, uh, uh, earth tones are very much uh, a trend uh, as are the white interiors it would appear from the last few motor shows that we've seen so uh, you know it, it, to each their own taste um you know of course all right speaking of taste um i would like to move on to the mitsubishi um me tech my tech um, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure uh, concept which uh, kind of builds a little bit on the evolution. Uh, and there's two E's in there. That's why I'm stressing that E a little bit um, that we saw two years ago at the Mitsubishi stand. Uh, this is uh, from what we know, the first car that was uh, you know, done with the help of Alessandro D'Ambrosio, who took over at Mitsubishi uh, as, I think, chief designer under uh, Kunimoto-san uh, about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this, this uh, I find this a bit strange. Um, it's somehow cool, but at the same time, it's just like it looks like a Hot Wheel or something like that. I mean, what, what do you think? This, this, this is a this is this is the epitome of Tokyo. I mean, this is what Tokyo stands for. It's like, well, this is strange, kind of cool, but still strange. Uh, like you say, it's very much Tokyo. It's um, this is the type of stuff that you kind of expect out of a motor show, um, out of a Japanese motor show. It's uh, I don't see any real use to this. Uh, it's a two passenger beach buggy essentially. It's the Japanese Mitsubishi's take on a Jap- on a on a beach buggy from the seventies or um, you know that was kind of 
within California culture. So if that's what they're trying to mimic, then I guess it's successful. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I guess it, because it's a concept, it's going to be, um, you know, there's certain elements, perhaps the front face of that car or, you know, the, um, the body side cladding or maybe the rear or something like that, that is going to make it over to production, perhaps the tail lamps, things like that. Um, but I don't really see any practical <laughs> use for an open air two seater four by four. Um, you know, I, I don't really, I mean, look, if they want to have fun and they want to blow some, some money on the showcasing a concept, that's going to get people talking about it. Uh, to me, it's, it's really, it just kind of smacks of vulgarity. Uh, I don't really see anything, um, particularly interesting from a design perspective. Um, it's, you know, yeah, let's just have some fun and, uh, and see what we can make with whatever budget and showcase our EV, um, plug in, uh, powertrain. So I don't know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a fan. It's not for me. <laughs> I would like to say one thing. Like I'm. I'm. I'm quite happy about this, uh, especially compared to looking back at the Volkswagen EV buggy that they did, uh, because that was just terrible. Um, this one, I, it's crazy. You know, but do do I like the design? Man, this is this is confusing as hell. But it sure is fun. Um, would I would I rent this for a day just to like you know go crazy in some dunes and stuff like that? Uh, yes, I would. Would I would I ever buy something like this? Oh hell no! Like you know that would be a bit embarrassing driving around with something like this. But uh, as as really like a fun car. I mean you know if you would imagine I don't know going to the Emirates and going into the into the desert and you have this car to drive around. That would be good fun, you know. I mean, this is this is this is the thing, and this is in the end for me what what I like about the Japanese is like you know they're still seeing the fun in these these kind of things, and they're a little bit strange. But uh, you know, uh, I I, w I would love to hear more from the listeners and comments on this one um, because I, I I just have no idea what to think of it. It's it's cool. It's weird. Um, I don't know. It's, is, 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 it, is it needed? Is it necessary? Does it have any kind of purpose? It's almost going back to the uh, the Audi we saw in Frankfurt, this kind of moon, you know, moon raker car or whatever it was. It's just like, okay, so you spent money on this. Like, did you not have any kind of other ideas or like, you know, other things to maybe showcase how you can be more sustainable or like a little bit more, you know, eco-friendly and stuff like that. But hey, uh, sometimes you need to spend money for fun, right? I guess. I, I mean, the only kind of redeeming factor is the interior and the IP, the air vents are quite interesting with the, you know, the, the, the shape of them. Um, you know, so that is, that is interesting. And it's a kind of a recurring theme where they've explored that, uh, that graphic um, in the grill and behind the seats and on the IP for the, for the HVAC. And, you know, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, and again, if this is a, an open top concept with no roof, then, um, you know, I guess they kind of have to keep things uh, fairly water um, resistant. Yeah. So uh, I guess that that would that would work. Um, yeah. And the one thing that I do actually really like about it is, again, they're showcasing technology, even in a vehicle like this, um, where they have the entire um, uh, windscreen just become mm -hmm. a head up display. So it's showing Thing in terms of like yaw angle and everything for off-road driving which is you know can be quite useful I'm sorry, you know when you're driving off uh, off-road but then they just have this very little tiny screen in front of the steering wheel so it's not overrun with uh with, with technology um and you know uh, everything's kind of operated by this uh this i drive controller in the center console and um yeah i mean it's it's got certain little redeeming factors from a technology perspective um, and you know, it's, uh, I think it's clean from an IP perspective. Um, but yeah, it's not something that I, I see particularly relevant. And I think that brings us to the next one. And, uh, let's talk about Lexus. Lexus has showcased the car, the LF30 concept, which was actually conceived in the uh, Nice studio in France by uh, Ian Cartabiano, uh, leading the team over there. And uh, this is very much Lexus, uh, I would say, from the show cars that we've seen from them. Uh, quite experimental, gullwing doors as well, as well, massive gullwing doors, I have to say, on a very little hinge, uh, you know, to, to open. So well done to the, the the guys who built that kind of car because that that, that, that seemed a little bit, you know, like a, like a task and like a challenge to do something like that. But uh, uh, very Lexus, uh, very... Uh, you know, predicting what they think of the future of luxury, um, you know, 
automobiles, cars, vehicles can be. But it also looks like, uh, you know, we'll probably never see the light uh, as it is. Yeah, I don't know. I've actually heard that it is quite kind of near production, this thing, um, you know, and I don't know how close to production it would be. It's got a lot of very interesting features that we've seen on many other Lexus vehicles in the past, um, like the seats, for example, extremely lightweight, um, you know, transparent with just this fabric covering a shell. Uh, it's something that we've seen before, and it's like a kinetic seat from maybe six years back. Um, really very interesting. Um, I, I like I like this car. To me, this was the star of the show. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's busy. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, it's it's uh, there's like some fluid organic surfacing. There's the spindle grill taking on a new identity of its own, like um, massive. You know, just the entire front face is this Lexus like, spindle grill. But I, I do lo- like the 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 plunging. Uh, uh, windscreen, you know, all the way almost to the front of the car. It gives it this really very futuristic uh, profile and aesthetic where you've got just this massive piece of glass going all the way from the rear um, to the to the front of the vehicle. Um, you know, and it's quite, uh, yeah, it's quite dynamic looking. Um, so, you know, it's definitely over the top, definitely, uh, you know, um, out there. Um, the rear is like, you know, really space age, very, very um, sci-fi thing over here. But again, this is a, a car that is, you know, powered by in-wheel electric motors. I mean, everything is very futuristic about this. So why not have the aesthetic kind of play into that story? So I, from a, yeah, the, the narrative is, is, is really quite good. And again, I think it was the, uh, for me, not having been to Tokyo, having seen only photographs of what was unveiled there. Um, this to me appears to be the star of the show. It does have some really cool uh, details. Uh, you mentioned already the uh, the seats; um, they they look very interesting. What I like about it is it doesn't look over the top from the interior, at least from the pictures that we have seen. Uh, it seems that it you know it could become feasible rather soon. Uh, maybe apart from the steering wheel, I think this is you know a little bit like you know Blade Runner style uh, from from that side, but. You know, it has a little head-up display. It has obviously a couple of screens. Um, you know, for me, it, it, it's similar to what we've mentioned with the Mitsubishi as well. This is also very much, you know, Tokyo. I mean, this 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 car fits the show perfectly. Uh, it's it's a bit over the top, but it's not absolutely crazy. So that you would say, like, oh my god, what is going on with them? There's there is enough clues in there that could become into a production car, um, but it still plays with the idea of, hey, look, what, what we would be capable of doing if we wouldn't have you know, some safety restrictions and all these kind of things. What I do find very interesting is this extremely subtle use of uh, lighting. If you look into the front, the actual lights, you know, the front lights, uh, they are really nicely integrated actually into you know, the edges, into the, the, the carryover of the front. Um, I do very much like that. Uh, from the rear as well. It's a very subtle use of the lights, but still very prominent in that one. Uh, that obviously has to do with the with the color job as well, uh, so that it fits very well. This is like a turquoise, uh, you know, shiny green that they're using with some black accents in there. So if you have, you know, a very like a whitish front light and a reddish uh, rear light, then uh, there's a nice little contrast in there. Uh, the only thing that I would like to say, there's some parametric modeling in there as well. So like, you know, guys, you know, you don't need that, especially in like, you know, the rear, uh, which would probably go towards the the, uh, the C pillar um, from that side. So, you know, I'm not quite sure if this is, this is required. This is what makes it a little bit too much. But uh, generally speaking, um, I would agree, this is probably the most comprehensive of the show cars being shown in, uh, in Tokyo. And probably the one where we say, like, you know, this is this is quite cool. And if, if elements of that make it into really the production car, then we are uh, we're, we're pretty pretty happy about this. And uh, speaking of uh, speaking of show cars from Toyota, because obviously Lexus is part of Toyota, let's talk about the Toyota e racer concept. Which I it, I have a little bit of a feeling this might come to Gran Turismo uh, Sport at some point in the future. Uh, I like it. It's you know, it's a nice little racer. It's a, it's a one seater, uh, cool racing car. Quite simple. It's it's made for driving, and uh, it's it's kind of a little bit strange that this is also supposed to be a autonomous vehicle, 
because when I see this, this is like, oh, this is something I would like to drive. This is nothing where I would just like sit in and being, you know, driven around the corner with like, you know, 150, 200 kilometers an hour. Yeah. I mean, I guess, um, you know, the, the e-racer elements of, uh, of this car's name means that it's, you know, it's very much going to be, you know, uh, one of these cars that um, is made for the autonomous era, but that still allows you to kind of pilot it around on a race course if you want to have some fun or whatever. Um, you know, I guess, you know, that is, you know, makes sense. Um, it's it's a single seat little sports car, you know, and um, from, aesthetically, it's majorly challenging, um, but uh, it's actually a two seater car. Um, but it, it, oh, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see the uh, the second seat. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it, it looks like I don't know. I mean, it's 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 it it looks very much like something out of a video game. And um, yeah, it's it's two seats in tandem. So um, you know, we've seen this kind of before as well on other concepts. But it's very, to me, very challenging. Uh, it looks very much like an insect, um, and you know, it's. I don't know. I, the roll bar, the way that it comes over the sides onto the top of the car, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it looks, it looks like a praying mantis of some sorts. It's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fan of this, but you know, again, maybe this is, uh, skipping my generation entirely. You know, it's, uh, it's going back to, you know, people that play video games. I don't, <laughs> um, people that, uh, you know, appreciate these, like, you know, things I'm sure if I got behind the whale and I took it around the track, I'd be quite interested. Um, but, you know, looking at it, it's, it's very much uh, a flight of fancy. Another another sci-fi element. Yeah, I mean, it's one of these cars, like I said, that will probably be presented in Gran Turismo, similar to the uh, recently presented Jaguar Gran Turismo car that we're going to talk about next time in the uh, in, in normal podcast. So, it, you know, this will this will not come to life. This will probably be a digital car, and for that, you know, I'm not mad at it at all. It aims to walk towards like a KTM crossbow, maybe you know, uh, a back mono or something like that. But it's it's nothing that will probably see the light from from what we can see, and that's probably not a loss or a bad thing um, in that sense. But what will see the light, and this is the uh, last one we're going to talk about today, is the uh, Toyota Mirai concept, which is uh, very, very close to production and will be released in 2021. And uh, that was, for me, a bit of a surprise, actually. Uh, I I knew the Mirai before, didn't necessarily like it at all. Uh, This one looks much more t- uh, sportier. Uh, seems like, you know, taking some clues with a massive grill from Aston Martin, which is technically something I personally don't like. Um, but that was actually a surprise. That was uh, that was not bad for what we expected from a Mirai. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, when I initially saw, because this car was actually unveiled before the, uh, the show, it was probably the first car unveiled. Um, uh, it, it, it was shown before the uh, show was even on. And, um, yeah, uh, like you say, the Mirai has been out before it's, this is, you know, hi, um, Toyota's hydrogen fuel cell, um, vehicle that is available right now on the roads, but it looks very, very strange and like an ugly duckling, some would say. Um, and it, it takes a lot of design cues from the Prius, actually, but it takes it even a step further, and it looks quite, um, again, uh, vulgar, I would say. Now, this is quite elegant when you compare it to the current car. Um, it seems like it's quite a bit uh, bigger. Like, again, when I first saw the images that they released, um, the press images, it was almost like it was stretched Mm -hmm. like it was on a wide angle lens because it looked totally like the front end was way long. The lamps were seriously stretched out and everything Um, to see it in real photos, I guess is, is a little bit better. It's not as, um, as not as, as stretched as I thought it would be. Um, But yeah, this is uh, definitely a step forward in my opinion. Um, It's more elegant, certainly more pleasing aesthetically, less, polarizing so if you want something that already has a 
um, you know, an experimental quote unquote engine uh, power source, shall we say, um, then, you know, maybe you don't want to draw attention to yourself quite as much as with the current uh, generation Mirai. So the, the new one is definitely much more subtle. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's still um, a Toyota, uh, you can tell. Um, it actually has a lot of, um, particularly on the body side, and I think maybe even the front face and the headlamps, um, mm-hmm. some, some Lexus feel to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more of a proportionally uh, better uh, looking vehicle. Um, and more traditional, certainly, um, than the uh, than the current Mirai. I definitely agree uh, with what you just said. I think this car is actually, you know, you have a little bit of a feeling it's made for a more global market rather than maybe just a local market uh, f- such as Japan. I mean, this car seems, from a design perspective, perspective much more ready for the U.S. market, um, I think, especially with, you know, the, some design clues. I think they're more U.S.-oriented than maybe uh, European oriented, but in uh, excuse me, but in general, the the push for a little bit more sophistication, subtleness uh, in the design is uh, is very very welcome. I think from uh, from Toyota. Again, the only thing for me is this is massive grill. Uh, I've criticized it with the new Vantage. Uh, there is absolutely no closure to the grill, so it looks. From a graphic perspective, very similar to just like whole. Uh, I'm personally not a massive fan of this, um, but I also do have to say I'm not an expert on uh, fuel cell, um, uh, you know, the, you know the, the kind of cooling of the fuel cell. So uh, there, there's probably a reason to have it like that. But in general, um, I would uh, I would say this is a good step forward uh, for for the guys over at Toyota with that kind of car. And uh, and definitely, you know, if, if, if that is any kind of clue to maybe what could happen to a Prius, uh, then, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next Prius <laughs> from, uh, from that side. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's as aerodynamic, but again, it's got a, a fastback, um, you know, like a Audi A5 type thing, sportback looking thing. Um, so I can't imagine that it would be, that it would fare worse aerodynamically mm-hmm. um but it definitely has is far more elegant um and you know again and what's interesting actually is this kind of integrated t- ducktail spoiler that they've got on the rear mm-hmm. um which probably has everything to do with aero um as to why it is that they created that and uh, i think it's quite appealing um certainly um from certain angles um the rear three quarter in particular um so yeah i mean it's a, it's a, it's an interesting car, well proportioned. Whether or not they need that massive, like you know, um, uh, hood, uh, you know, it's definitely got a good dash to axle ratio, which lends more towards kind of luxury proportions. Um, certainly for, <laughs> over the previous vehicle, um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's nice. And again, I think yes, it's very much geared towards the American market, which is where they're exper- experimenting quite heavily with hydrogen vehicles and they've been testing hydrogen fuel cells over there in california for quite some time um and yeah i think uh from from that market perspective this is the definition of an elegant car as opposed to a a prius or certainly the current generation mirai all right then we got through a virtual walk around (laughs) uh through the tokyo motor show 2019 Thank you, Eric, for taking the time, as always, to record this lovely little podcast with me. Pleasure. Uh, for everybody, because we have not mentioned this in the beginning, the people can find you on Instagram as yes. well as on Twitter at, uh, you know, at, you know, the, the at sign at uh, concept, uh, sorry, not concept house, that is me, uh, at form trends. Uh, on yes. both channels and uh, yeah so you can find me on social media channels on at uh, concert house that's how we where we operate on with most of the uh, the pictures that we're sharing and all these things and sketches in particular from eric's side so uh, follow us on that one please do leave us some feedback on the on the podcast uh, if you are on itunes and listen to us on the apple platform please do give us a five-star rating because that helps to push us a little bit into the uh, into the uh, rankings over there and uh, for everybody else uh, follow us of course on Spotify uh, Deezer in your pod roll wherever you are on you know, Overcast or whatever you're using and uh, in that sense we're looking forward to the next 
normal episode where we'll be talking about the latest cars in, uh, yeah, I don't know, the next few days, I would say, Eric. Yeah, so next week or something like that. That's probably the plan. Next week, yeah. Sounds about right. Cool. Yeah. Sounds about right. Good. Well, thanks very much, guys, for joining Thank us. Thank you. And um, till the next one. Thanks, Martin. Take care. Bye. Cheers.